but they knew about three kinds of particles. There was the electron, and the electron orbits around the nucleus of an atom. And inside the nucleus, there were two kinds of particles, protons and neutrons. So three particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons, and three forces of nature. There was the electromagnetic force. Back in the 19th century, we had unified electricity and magnetism. And electromagnetism is what keeps the electron bound to the proton. There's the nuclear force that keeps the protons and neutrons bound to each other in the nucleus. Then there's gravity, and gravity just pulls everything close to everything else. The picture of the atoms, the protons and neutrons, it's incomplete, but it didn't go away. It just got improved a little bit. So we know that if you dig inside the proton and the neutron, they're not themselves elementary particles. They are made of smaller particles called quarks. There is an up quark and a down quark, and a proton is two ups and a down. A neutron is two downs and an up. And then there's a fourth kind of particle called the neutrino. The neutrino interacts with the other particles with a new force called the weak nuclear force. So what we thought of as one nuclear force split into two, the strong force and the weak force. The weak force is very weak. You don't need to understand it to get through your everyday life, but it does help the sun shine. When two protons come together inside the sun and get, one of them gets converted into a neutron, that's the weak nuclear force at work. You spit out a neutrino in the process. So that's not much more complicated. Instead of three particles and three forces, we have four particles and four forces. There is the slight complication that these matter particles, the electron, the neutrino, the up quark, and the down quark, form one family of particles. Those four particles are a family. And there's two more families. Nobody has any idea why. There's the muon, which is a heavier version of the electron, the tau, that is a heavier version of that, and every one of these particles has two heavier versions of themselves, no idea why. So if you want the summary of all this in one uh, elegant picture, here is the flowchart. <laughs> I actually had to make the flowchart smaller than I wanted uh, for purposes of book publishing, but this flowchart tells you what particle you are. We're not going to go through all the details. There are basically two kinds of particles. There are the fermions. These are the matter particles. These are things that you and I and tables and planets are made of. The quarks that are inside the protons and neutrons and the leptons that fly around by themselves. And then there are the bosons. These are the particles that can pile on top of each other to make force fields. So you get the weak force, you get gravity, you get the strong force, you get electromagnetism. And then way up by itself in a different color, there's one more particle called the Higgs boson. So your first hint as to why the Higgs boson is so interesting is that it is a different kind of particle than any of the other particles that we had detected before. And the reason why, we'll go back to its, no, its, its nature as a field. So why did we come up with the idea of the Higgs boson back in 1964? What was wrong with just saying, all right, we have these different forces, we have these different matter particles, and we're done? The problem was, back in the 1950s and 60s, we were trying to understand those nuclear forces. Remember, you have gravity and electromagnetism, and they kind of made sense to us. And the reason why they made sense is they are long-range forces. Think again of this lantern that is moving away from you. How dim does it get as it moves away from you? Surprisingly, at first, until you figure it out, the, the formula for the brightness of the lantern is also an inverse square law. Just like the formula for Newtonian gravity, the strength of gravity and the brightness of a lantern obey the same mathematical relationship. Why is that? The answer is because space has three dimensions. And that should not be perfectly obvious to you. But if you think about some object, think about either gravity or electricity, the electric field or whatever, you have lines of force that stretch out from that object, just like the lines of the light rays stretching out from your lantern. And the lines of force don't disappear. What they do is they get dilute. Here nearby the object, they're very closely packed, and that means the force is strong. Far away, they are diluted. They are further away from each other, and therefore the force is weaker. How weaker is it? Well, if you sort of draw a sphere at some fixed radius, a sphere has an area that goes like the distance squared. The reason why the strength of the force goes down as the distance squared is because the area over which the lines of force are diluted goes up as the distance squared. So that's a very nice, elegant little picture that connects the behavior of forces to the geometry of space, but it only works for electromagnetism and gravity. 
For the nuclear forces, for the strong and weak nuclear forces, they don't obey an inverse square law. That's why we don't feel them in our everyday lives. They only stretch over very, very short distances. So you might say, well, this is your job, theoretical physicist. Let's figure out why these forces are so short range. And that was the challenge taken up in the 1950s. And it was really hard. <laughs> it turns out that this is sort of mathematically almost forced on you by the nature of these theories, that you should get an inverse square law. It took a lot of genius, and it has been uh, the, the subject of multiple Nobel Prizes, to figure out why the strong and weak nuclear force only stretch over a short range. And it turns out, if you want to understand how nature works, if you want to predict ahead of time how nature works, the principle you should have in your mind is, what would make the lives of physics graduate students the most complicated it could be? So in the case of the nuclear forces, the answer as to why they are short range is utterly different for the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. For the strong nuclear force, there's something called confinement. There are lines of force. There are particles called gluons that stretch out from the quarks and so forth. But the gluons interact with each other. And what that means is the lines of force become all tangled up with each other. And the ultimate effect of that is like your lantern has a shutter around it that is holding in all the light. If your head is inside the shutter, the lantern looks very bright. You go outside, it, you don't see it at all. That's what the structure of a proton is like. If your head is inside the proton, the strong nuclear force is very, very strong. If you're far away, you don't feel the strong nuclear force at all. And what that is kind of like is all these lines of force interacting with each other so that none of them leak out to infinity. This is called confinement. There's a whole bunch of uh, mathematical, beautiful mathematics behind understanding it. And there's a prize offered of a million dollars if you understand it perfectly, because no one does quite yet. In the case of the weak nuclear force, utterly different, like I said, imagine that the lantern that is moving away from you is surrounded by fog. Imagine it's a foggy night. OK, then the lantern fades away for a little while, but pretty soon it fades away completely because the light that is coming from the lantern is absorbed by the fog between you and the lantern. So in this case, the lines of force truly do end. Effectively, the lines of force just get absorbed by this medium around them. And the idea that physicists proposed in the early 1960s is that the weak nuclear force is absorbed by a field that pervades empty space. This is kind of a big idea, so you can imagine that people laughed at them, and they did. They were ridiculed for this idea. Uh, I remember very, very well my old professor of quantum field theory uh, telling us the story of how he looked forward to the seminar by this guy named Peter Higgs, and how he and his students were going to attack him and show that he was wrong. Didn't work that way, as it turns out. But uh, the proposal is that empty space itself is full of the quantum field theory equivalent of fog. That is to say, empty space itself has a new kind of field everywhere around us. There's an invisible energy field pervading the universe that eats up the lines of force, making the weak interaction short range. It is a very, very dramatic idea. Obviously, if it were right, it would have big consequences. It was a sufficiently difficult idea that no one person came up with it. Peter Higgs is one of the people who came up with it, and he had the coolest sounding last name. So his name gets attached to what we call the Higgs mechanism and the Higgs boson and the Higgs field. But Phil Anderson, Francois Anglier, Robert Brout, Tom Kibble, Gerald Guralnik, Richard Hagen all came up with the idea independently. Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg put it to work in the weak interactions of particle physics. And Gerard de Tuff showed that it all made mathematical sense. So it took many, many very smart people putting this theory together. And again, we're talking about the first half of the 1960s. We're talking about quite a while ago. So just to uh, say once again what we're thinking about here is that this Higgs field the way that we talk about nature is to propose new fields and then how they interact with things. The difference between the Higgs field and all the other fields of nature is that in empty space, in the zero energy state, when space is as empty as it can possibly be, the Higgs field has a big non-zero value. So other fields, if you think about what they're doing in empty space, here's your location in space, here's the value of the field, there's small oscillations just because of the miracle of quantum mechanics. 
quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle says you can't pin down a field to an absolutely quiescent zero value, but you can have it pretty darn quiet, so it's just gently fluctuating even in empty space. So this includes the electromagnetic field, the strong interactions, the quark fields, the electron fields, the neutrino fields, et cetera. The Higgs field in empty space is way up here. So as you walk through the universe, as you wave your hand through space, you are moving through Higgs field. It is everywhere at some big non-zero value. The question is, how would you ever know? That means a dramatic idea. Empty space has this field in it that's affecting all the other fields around it. How would you know it's true? The answer is you poke the field and it vibrates. And you see a vibration in a field as a particle. This idea that the universe is filled with this new field called the Higgs field makes a prediction that there's a new particle called the Higgs boson. So what we're trying to do is to look for the Higgs boson particle because that would be evidence that there is a Higgs field in empty space and that would explain why the weak interactions are short range. That's why we wanted to do it in the first place. There's another thing that the Higgs field does, which is, was a complete bonus. It was a spin-off. It was an unanticipated benefit of this Higgs field idea. Namely, it can explain why other particles have mass. And this is the first explanation that is usually given, and it's much harder to understand. It, in fact, was not even thought of by Peter Higgs or any of those other guys who invented the idea in the first place. It was Steven Weinberg, uh, a couple of years later, who was struggling with the idea that he had what he thought was a really good theory of the weak interactions, but it had one flaw. It only works if all the particles of nature are massless. Electrons, quarks he didn't know about, but protons, neutrons, whatever, they would have to have zero mass. And what it means if you have zero mass is that you move at the speed of light. That's what Einstein says. You can have massless particles like photons, gravitons, but they move at the speed of light. And Weinberg realized that that would be bad Think about what an electron does. An electron orbits around an atom. And the reason why it can orbit around an atom is because it has mass. It can settle down, be brought to zero velocity, and therefore you can get atoms, you can get molecules, you can get chemistry, you can get life. If the electron were massless, it would never bind to a proton to make an atom. There would be no atoms. There would be no life in the universe. All of the interesting complexity around us in the universe is only made possible because the electron has a mass. And Steven Weinberg's brilliant theory wouldn't work because uh, his theory predicted very clearly the electron had to be massless. What he realized was there was this thing called the Higgs field, which if it filled empty space, broke the symmetry that prevented particles from getting mass. And now, with the Higgs in the background, the electron can get a mass. It can settle into atoms, you can have chemistry, you can have the world we see. So it's because the electrons in your body are moving through this invisible Higgs field that they're not moving at the speed of light, that they get some heft, some inertia that we, that we perceive as mass. So we want to know, is this idea correct or not? This is an idea going back to the 1960s. We want to test it. We want to do good particle physics. So we build the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, what does it do? Well, you take individual protons, which are nice because they're relatively heavy, stable, electrically charged particles, and you accelerate them. You get them going to 99.999999% the speed of light. And what that means is they have a lot of energy. And then you take other protons and you zoom them in the other direction and you smash them together and you watch what comes out. So because they have this enormous amount of energy, Einstein says E equals mc squared. If you have a lot of energy, you can make new particles with a lot of mass. So sometimes this idea of smashing particles together, the particle physicists do, is explained by saying, imagine you smash two wristwatches together and you watch the pieces come out and you try to figure out how wristwatches work that way. This is a really dumb analogy because when you smash the protons together, the things that come out were never inside the particles in the first place. What's going on is remember the world is made of fields. The proton is made of quarks and gluons, which are little vibrating fields, and they're vibrating so enormously, that's what it means to have high energy, that those fields can interact with other fields around them and start them vibrating. And we see this as brand new particles coming out. So a better analogy would be smashing two Timex watches together and a Rolex appears. <laughs> it's rare, 
but you're creating something that wasn't there before. To do this is an enormous technological challenge.